Yo, today I wanted to show my entire color grading workflow and process along with the tools that I use uh, to get to my final images. I have never had any formal training with color grading. Everything I've learned is just from online. Uh, I do want to shout out Joshua Kirk and Colin Kelly especially. They're probably the two resources that I have used the most and gained the most knowledge from. And a lot of my workflow comes from their advice and their videos as well as their own workflows. So here we're in the media tab of DaVinci and the first thing I do after I import footage is go to the master settings. Uh, we're working with some uh, 4K footage. So I'll set that to UHD. And then in color management, so color management can be pretty confusing, but um, now that I understand it, it's pretty simple. I like to do things actually in the color management tab of the project settings, not in CSTs um, for each individual clip. So what I do is I go out of DaVinci Wire to be color managed and I go to custom. So the settings we're gonna change is the input color space. So this is um, the color space that we shot in and what we're inputting to the timeline, our timeline color space, which is the working color space. Uh, this is where we're making all of our adjustments in. And then the output color space, this is what we're actually gonna be viewing uh, on the screen as we monitor while we edit. I'll quickly go out here. I just have three clips in here. These are two Sony clips and this is a Fuji clip. So in something like this, our my A cam would be the Sony because most of the footage is shot on that. And then maybe our B cam is this Fuji. So Again, why should be color managed? Go to custom, input color space. Um, so since our A cam is a Sony, we shot S cam at three cine, so that's what I'm gonna pick here. Timeline color space. I'm gonna go with DaVinci um, Intermediate. This is just the widest color space and gives you the most flexibility. So that's what I'm gonna work in. And then the working luminance, I crank that all the way. And then output color space. Uh, this is what we want to view, which is Rec. 709. I go with Rec. 709A. This has been giving me the best results that I've seen so far, at least for me. And then down here at the bottom, I'm just going to put this 3D lookup table to tetrahedral. And immediately now we see that these two clips are viewing properly in Rec. 709. This one is still in log. And that's because we set our input color space to uh, the Sony and not the Fuji. So all I have to do to get this is select all the clips with that same thing and then go down to Fujifilm and choose my correct color space. So in this case, Fuji F-Log and there we go. Now it looks great. Everything is ready to go except for these two. These are shot anamorphic. So I'll just go ahead and de-squeeze these real quick. Um, so 1.6 is. So now all our media in our media pool is ready to go. I do this before um, color grading starts. I wanna make sure that throughout the entire post-production process and also during production, we're seeing as close to the final image as we possibly can, which uh, generally means Rec. 709. So that's why it's the first thing I do. I make sure even if I'm not editing, um, the editor is looking at the correct image, anyone giving feedback on the edit is looking at as close to the final image as they can get. I think that's super important. So now that all this is ready to go, I can throw this all on a quick timeline here and we'll go into the color tab. So once I actually start color grading here, we imagine our edit is done, picture is locked. I have uh, four main steps to my color grading. There's the organization, then there's the color correction, then there's the look development, and then there is the color grading. So I start by organizing my footage. This consists of grouping my clips and setting up my node trees. So I'm gonna set up my standard node tree. Uh, here I just keep all my node trees. These are essentially power grades that give me these templates. So here's my standard clip level template that I can just drag on. And you can see it's done absolutely nothing to the image here. There's no actual adjustments being made. This is just a node structure that I can follow, which is consistent between every single clip that I work with. It allows me to move faster and um, 
yeah, just generally save time and keep me less confused. So I can just apply this to all the clips on the timeline. So now all these are working the exact same. So when I go from clip to clip, I know exactly where everything is. Next thing I'll do is group my clips together. This is one of my favorite features of Resolve is being able to group um, clips and then do pre-group clip level adjustments and post-group clip level adjustments. So that's what I'll do here. So for example, if we're if this is a short film, and we have these two shots which are in the same scene and then this is a different shot um, from a different scene then I can just go ahead and select these two and add into a new group I'd probably name that something specific to the scene and I can do the same thing for this other clip or whatever else would be in that um, in this group so typically I'll group things into like a setting or a scene so maybe there's a lot of scenes in a uh, specific bedroom location with similar lighting. So I'll group all those together. Maybe we have a lot of day exteriors. Maybe I'll group those all together or it can be individually each scene depending on whatever we need. And now all my uh, clips are organized and ready to start the next step, which is color correction. Now color correction for me takes place primarily in these two nodes, the primary and balance node. So the primary node is just a regular serial node and I'll usually go into my offset and just adjust this up or down depending on what I think the exposure should sit at. And the whole goal of color correction is to get things uh, looking consistent. And I'm trying to make sure that uh, say these two clips have similar exposure. So I'll also bring this one down at the same time. And the next thing I'll do to each clip is go to my balance node. Um, this is something that can be optimized since I like to do my balancing in the HDR tab. Uh, I find that this is just my favorite way to balance clips. So it is a little bit annoying having to switch between my primaries and my HDR every time I switch here. Um, but from here, I can go into my global and pull things around to make them a little more balanced in the way I want them to be. Or I can just go straight into this temperature and tint and do things that way. And then of course I'm balancing multiple clips. So this one I would probably also do something like that. And that's pretty much where most of my color correction ends. Sometimes I might go into the lift gamma and gain for this step, but not all the time. And uh, I'll explain the rest of these nodes later, but for now, let's start and go into the next step, which is group post clip. Here, I'm gonna apply my look development node tree. And as you see, everything is gray here. That's just because I have this DCTL that gives me a middle gray for DaVinci uh, Intermediate. So I can just delete that node. And then we have a density, hue, saturation, split tone, and contrast. Again, now we're in the group post clip. So anything I do here is gonna affect everything in this group. So just these two clips. So here I start with my contrast and I just go into my curves, choose my luminance. And uh, we have this anchor point for 18% gray. Um, this makes it so any adjustments we do here isn't actually adjusting the overall exposure of the shot really um, we're just focusing on contrast and tonality here so from here i can add my little s curve however dramatic i want it to be it's already pretty contrasty so maybe we'll just do that for now and uh, i can spend a good amount of time on this uh, i can also bring down like the white point bring up the black point all that kind of stuff and that gives me a consistent contrast throughout the entire scene my next step is split toning for this i use a dctl that i found this works very similarly to just doing it in the curves so i'll just show you that really quick here so in the curves we can just choose one of these channels red green and blue and uh so we can warm up our highlights a little bit by adding some red and some green and see what that's doing here warming up our sky mostly and then we can increase our blue and our green here and here's our little quick split tone so we warm up our sky cool down our shadows a pretty standard look so i'm just going to reset this and you can see this does the exact same thing we have our highlight red green and blue channel and our shadow red green and blue channel um, but this is just an easier interface to work with and it's generally more precise and easier for me to understand so that's why i use this dctl but you don't have to so i can just select this graph and we get a similar thing that we were seeing in the curves 
and I can just go into my highlights and bring up the red just like we did before and a bit of the green and then we can um, maybe we'll do it subtractive in the shadows so we can take away some red and I'll turn off the graph and you can see this is on and off on and off so same idea and with the graph you can see it's very similar to just working in the curves uh, some other cool things you can do here though is you can adjust your pivot quickly so you can change where the highlights and shadows start and you can also change things like the pivot width so maybe you have skin tones you want to preserve so you can wind that out and then the uh, split toning will only happen in the further highlights and the further shadows you can also do things like neutral white so your whites will become uh, not affected by the adjustment and same thing with black so a lot more control and a lot more precise control i feel like with this tool which is why i choose to use it but there's definitely other ways that you can go about split toning my next node here is the saturation node this is taken straight from colin kelly this is just a serial node that we use the hsv color space and select only channel 2 and what that allows me to do is uh, use my gain to increase or de decrease contrast and this does it in a way where we're actually increasing kind of density as we saturate more uh, which I find better than just using the straight saturation knob down here. My next one is hue this one's the one that I use the least um, this is where I would go and do things like hue versus hue, hue versus sat so maybe a certain scene has a predominant color that I want to uh, mess with. I can do it here. I've also been using the color warper more for this. Uh, usually I'll go to this eight one and I can just go to a certain color and select it, increase, decrease saturation on it or shift the hue on it. Those kinds of, those kinds of adjustments are what I would do in this node. And this last one is density. This is another DCTL that is made by the same person as the other one. There he is. What I mostly do with this is use the density slider to bring down the luminance of certain colors, uh, which can give a nice effect sometimes. You can also do things like saturation, dense, and, and hue adjustments, but typically I'd rather just do those in the uh, color warper since I find sometimes it can break the image if I push things far with this tool. Uh, but this is also nice because we have things like this uh, skin and this foliage adjustment here. And that is the bulk of my look development. Of course, as I do all of this, I'm looking through uh, and auditioning this throughout all the clips within the group to make sure that uh, it's actually serving all the clips well. And uh, I will add that sometimes I will add other nodes to this. So maybe I have maybe a blur node and a film grain node or something like that here, maybe halation. I can do that on a group level uh say for things like if we have a scene that happened in the past and we want a different look versus the more modern scene where we don't need things like film grain and halation then we can go to the group clips so i may add on other notes for that but those are more just for effects and now i'm done with the look development and i can go back to the clip level and i'll explain the rest of these notes so we went through the primary and balance this i can still mess with during um the color grading part um, but these are mostly just for the color correction. This next one is saturation. This is the exact same as the saturation from the uh, post clip. So if I just need an individual clip to be more or less saturated, I can do the exact same adjustments here. Next one down here is the vignette. Uh, this is just a time saver. Oftentimes we need to add a vignette to a certain shot. This just makes it quick because I just connect it up here. And I can go into my gamma and adjust uh, this vignette here. And in this node, I can obviously adjust the power window to whatever I feel like. Right now I just have it set to something pretty general, um, but usually I will adjust that a little bit. This next one is the blur. Uh, this was also taken straight from a YouTube video recently, but this uses uh, a, the same thing, a power window here, and that is connected to the tilt shift blur effect uh, using the lens blur and i can crank that up for you and you can see now the edges of our frame are going to be blurred for kind of 
to emulate certain lens characteristics, uh, which I often use for stuff like this anamorphic footage. And this last one here is kind of just for whatever I want. So if I need to do another power window for like a face or something, or I need to do a qualification up here, uh, I can select that and then set up my mask and then I can adjust the qualification there. And since this all stems from the media in here, uh, anything color wise we adjust, it's not actually adjusting the qualifications that we make. So it's all non-destructive. And if I need more, then I will just go in and add another node and do the exact same thing. And I can connect them all to this parallel mixer and that can go on for however much I feel like I need for a certain shot. Again, all these go into a parallel mixer that goes into this final effects uh, node. So here I'll put maybe for this shot, I would put something like light rays on there. And again, this is all shot by shot. Not all shots would need light rays, but something like this, I think looks nice with a backlit shot like this. So now we have a quick little light ray effect. I can do things like glow if I want. Uh, just halation for a single shot, I would do it here. Anything like that, um, I would put the effect on that node. Of course, throughout this entire process, uh, just because I completed a step doesn't mean I can go back. If I still feel like I need to make color correction adjustments during my color grading, I'm totally able to do so just by going back to my primaries and balance. If uh, I feel like my look is a little too heavy and I need to tone things back or tweak things, I can always just go back and set that up. Everything's in a way where I can go back and make adjustments as you are always doing during color grading. So that is how I've built my workflow. And if we're using this clip as another scene, again, I would go through the entire scene, correct all the exposures here, um, go to my post clip, create my new look. Um, if I know it's gonna be similar to a previous clip, I can uh, copy and paste the same adjustments onto this and then make small tweaks if I know that the general look is going to be the same or I can just copy over the same contrast or the same split tone node if I know they're going to be similar scene to scene but that still allows me all the control to make any changes I want within a certain group and one last thing I want to mention is I'll often go to the timeline level especially on smaller projects um, where we just want you know a consistent film grain uh, across everything. This is where I would do that sort of thing. I would just go in here and uh, add my film grain, do all that kind of stuff in the timeline level. And that's pretty much it for my color grading workflow. As you can see, um, I prioritize color management, making sure everyone is looking at as close to the final image as they possibly can all the time. And I work in a way where I can always go back to my different steps and make adjustments to anything at any time in a non-destructive way. And I keep things consistent so that I know where everything is and I can move efficiently throughout the software. Again, though, this workflow isn't perfect. I'm gonna be tweaking it constantly and but this is where it is right now and i'm enjoying the results i get out of it and i'm not saying that you should copy this exact workflow but hopefully you can take away a few things and implement it into your own so that you can end up with results that are even better than what you've done before